Hello, I'm Alistair Hosshaberry, one of the senior associates at Gill Jennings and Every. Welcome to our introduction to patents talk from our series of expert talks on intellectual property IP. We have split the patents part into three sections of which this is the second. If you missed the first part, you can find this on our website. As an overview of what the three parts of this talk will cover, this part, part two, will go through how to identify a patentable innovation. Part one covered what a patent is and why you may wish to apply for a patent. And part three will cover what goes in for a patent, the process a patent application goes through to get granted, and how a patent can be used once it's granted. Moving on to the detail for this part, we're going to look at what a patent can be obtained for. Patents are intended to offer protection for technical innovations or the technical idea behind something. Now, what does technical mean? Well, unfortunately, there's no accepted definition of this. One way to look at what technical may mean is something that solves a problem that exists in an industry. This can be a new product, process, device, material, or something else entirely. But if you solve a problem faced by an area of industry, then that's usually a positive start along the journey to working out what a technical innovation could be and what a patent could be used for. What then needs to be done is to look at the requirements the law imposes on an innovation to qualify for receiving patent protection. Those requirements are the ones I've listed here on this slide. If you work your way to the end of this list for an innovation you have had, and each step is positive, then you may well be on to something that is patentable. To help you work through this, I'm going to cover each of the uh, items on this slide in a bit more detail over the next few slides. That is apart from the first of these, industrial applicability. Uh, the reason I'm not covering this is that, in fact, it's a relatively low bar to cross, and since it, and it really boils down to whether the innovation is able to be produced in some form, and there is a market for it. Moving on to novelty. The requirement that a, in, an innovation is new, typically referred to as novel, is one of the key tenets of patents. And the law is approximately the same across the world in this area, apart from on one aspect where uh, there are some variations between countries. Novelty is examined based on anything that was available to the public, typically before the earliest effective filing date of a patent application. By anything available to the public, I really do mean anything. So it includes scientific papers, published patents or patent applications, websites and their content, including things like YouTube videos and social media posts, and even extends to things like conference talks and other oral disclosures, among any other things you could think of that are, could be classed under publicly available. It's more difficult to work out exactly what was in an oral disclosure if there is no recording of one, but that does not make the disclosure of an oral disclosure any less valid as something that can mean an innovation is not new. It just makes it a bit more difficult to work out the details potentially. Also, it does not matter whether you've developed your innovation independently without being influenced by or seeing something that was available to the public. If there is something that is available to the public that discloses all the aspects of your innovations, um, then, or your in a particular innovation, then your innovation won't be considered novel, even if you've developed it independently. On a more positive note, all you need for an innovation to be novel is a single difference to what then public disclosure contains, as long as that difference contributes to the technical nature of the invention. I mentioned there was one aspect of novelty where there is a greater variation between countries. This variation is whether there is a grace period available in a country that allows you to discount certain publicly available matters from what is considered by a patent office when they are assessing novelty. Grace periods are steadily becoming more limited and typically now only protect against disclosures that have been made within a period of up to a year before a patent is filed and are made due to a breach of confidence or possibly that are made by the owner of an innovation that is covered by that patent. In the UK and before the European Patent Office, there is a grace period, but it provides minimal protection, so it's not something that should typically be relied upon. What all this means is that if you develop an innovation you think may be patentable, you need to keep the details of it confidential. So no telling your friends since 
there's that's an oral disclosure or publishing a blog paper or posting about it on social media if you need to tell someone they need to understand the information is confidential if you're to retain the ability to file a patent application for it and preferably you should have a non-disclosure agreement in place before you discuss the details with them inventive step is possibly the most difficult aspect to assess for any innovation this is because it addresses the question about whether an innovation is obvious over what came before it. For questions such as this, it's easy for the assessment to be subjective. However, each patent needs to be treated fairly. So there needs to be some way of turning that subjective test into an objective test. So what happens for, to address this is the same starting point as novelty is used, meaning the same publicly available materials are used for the inventive step assessment. The differences between those materials and the innovation as defined in the patent are worked out, which is really what the novelty part is. Assuming there are differences, those differences are then assessed to work out if they would be obvious to a person who knows everything in the field of the innovation, but is incapable of having any inspiration themselves, any spark of genius. We call that person the skilled person or person skilled in the art. An assessment is then conducted as to whether that person could have overcome the differences between what came before the innovation to arrive at the innovation based only on what was publicly available. This assessment looks at a number of things, including motivation, whether the skilled person is led in one direction or another, and whether a difference is just a standard variation of something that came before it. The Patent Office will look into this area and a patent owner or their patent attorney will argue with the examiner over this point to ultimately allow the examiner to arrive at a conclusion on whether those differences are obvious or not. If the differences are not obvious, then the innovation is considered to pass this inventive step requirement and can move on to other sort of assessments along the way to being granted a patent. Now, there are a number of carve outs from what is able to be patented. A paraphrase list of these areas excluded in the UK and at the European Patent Office is shown here. Uh, the list of exclusions varies from country to country, but even with those variations, mostly the result is that the patent protection is prohibited in the same general fields as, there, as shown here, but possibly via a different route. The areas in the list here are typically excluded from being patented because some they are protected by some other form of IP right um, that is apart from the first bullet point, the last bullet point, business methods, and the innovations considered to be immoral. Um, in terms of the, the matters covered by the first bullet point and uh, immoral innovations, these are excluded because there is a consensus that nobody should be able to have a monopoly over, for example, a fundamental law of physics, or benefit from something the whole of society considers to be immoral. For business methods, this is excluded because there are generally accepted um, it's generally accepted in this area that business methods fail the test of whether an innovation that is encompasses a business method is technical. So business methods are not typically in, considered technical. Um, it's sometimes possible to obtain a patent when on the face of it innovation falls in one of these excluded areas and the list here is an exhaustive list of those excluded areas. The reason it's possible to obtain patent protection for one of these areas at times is because the list, these areas are, are only uh, excluded from patentability when the patent exclusively relates to one or more of these exclusions. Some examples of where these exclusions can be navigated round could be a blue squash ball, a computer program that processes an x-ray image, or a surgical clamp. Now the blue squash ball could be considered to be an aesthetic creation, but if the blue, for example, makes it more visible uh, whilst in use, then that creates a, an effect over and above just the aesthetic nature of it, moving it more towards potentially an advantageous technical effect. And for the computer program that processes an X-ray, if it processes an X-ray image and outputs a clearer image than the one that would have been achieved just by taking the input image, then again, that's got, had an advantageous effect that is considered to be technical because it advances that innovation. Um, so they may no longer be excluded. In terms of the surgical clamp, 
this cannot itself carry out a treatment, but has to be used by a person to provide that treatment. The method of treatment exclusion is there to avoid medical professionals being stopped by a patent from treating patients. In the UK and before the European Patent Office, the way this exclusion is administered is that if there is no step in the patent that would stop the medical professional from working, such as a step in the patent of actually using the device or retrieving a sample, uh, then typically the innovation falls outside of this exclusion, since all of these exclusions are in fact take, uh, considered quite narrowly in terms of what they are applicable to cover. Excluded subject matter is often a tricky area. If you find yourself with an innovation in one of these areas, then you may wish to seek the advice of a patent attorney to help you navigate through these to find a path that will allow you to have a granted patent in this area. To be the legitimate uh, to be legitimately granted a patent, you need to own the innovation set out in the patent. This ensures someone does not just get granted a patent for an innovation, giving them the ability to stop others without developing the innovation themselves and putting the effort in that that takes, or having bought the ownership of that innovation from the ultimate um, creator. Ownership of an invention originates with the inventors. Due to this, it is always important to identify early who the inventors of an innovation are. Inventors are generally considered to be the individual or individuals who conceived of and developed the innovation. This does not extend to individuals who simply offered advice or carried out steps in the development without providing input themselves as to the path to follow to reach a goal for that innovation. When it is a company that is filing a patent application, this means the relationship between the company and each inventor has to be determined to work out how on the ownership of the invention passes to the company. For example, it needs to be worked out whether the inventor is, say, an employee, director, contractor, consultant, or in fact doesn't have any formal relationship with the company. Once this is known, it will need to be worked out which country's law applies to the ownership of an invention for each inventor. This can be determined by the location where the invention was developed and sometimes by the nationality or residence of an inventor. And indeed, the nationality or residence of an inventor may pull in other requirements that need to be considered. At that stage, it will then be possible to work out whether ownership of the invention needs to be transferred from one or more inventors to the company. Taking the UK as an example, ownership of an invention created by an employee who can be expected to develop innovations as part of their normal duties automatically passes to the company. So no action is needed to actively transfer ownership from the inventor to the company. On the other hand, if a consultant had been engaged to develop an innovation for a company, ownership would need to be formally transferred since there is no longer that automatic transfer, it has been active transfer at that point. This matter of ownership needs careful consideration, but it's usually quite simple to address once you've worked out what the facts are. Looking at how to capture inventions that are created as part of, for example, a research and development exercise, it may be expected that an inventor would look into whether their innovation passes all the requirements to work out if patent protection were possible. However, in my experience, when an inventor does this by themselves, given how close they typically are to an invention, inventors can find this process challenging, especially in relation to the inventive step part. This is because for the inventor, the solution to a problem they were trying to solve is almost always obvious and they can't tell why someone hasn't done it before. So to identify whether an invention may be patentable, it can be useful for the assessment to be conducted jointly between the inventor and a person independent from the development of the invention itself who can help to tease out the details. This allows the story of how and why the invention was developed to be explored and any other checks like who the inventor or inventors worked with to see if they should be included in the inventor to be um, assessed to just tie up any possible loose ends. Conducting this process with an inventor and someone not involved in the development of the invention can prove useful because, as we'll see in the next part of this talk, patent specification is really a story about how an invention is better than what has come before and why nobody could have envisaged the development the invention represents. 
which is then used to try to convince patent examiners to grant your patent. If you're interested in learning more about patents and other IP, you can look at our website. I'd also be happy to answer questions by email or you can connect with me on LinkedIn. I've really only scratched the surface of topics I've mentioned today in this part. So take a look at the other parts of this talk and upcoming sessions that will cover IP rights and delve into more detail on various aspects of these. Thank you for joining us.